you have a large following in the podcast space. How do you get successful when the whole point of your show is to put your <laughs> audience to sleep? It, 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 it adds some extra humility <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Welcome to Self Made and Sober. I'm your host, Andrew Lassis, and in this show, I'm going to be interviewing entrepreneurs and other people who are not only crushing it in business, but they have also struggled with addiction in the past and are currently in long term sobriety. And be sure to subscribe if you like what you're hearing so that you can get notified each time we put out a new episode. With me today is Drew Ackerman, aka Scooter of the Sleep With Me podcast. Drew, how are you doing? Pretty good. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a beautiful day uh, today where I live, so uh, I'm excited to talk. Yeah, I'm really excited to hear what you have to share with us. And so not only do you have one of the more successful podcasts out there, but you're also somebody who struggled with addiction and alcoholism in the past as well, right? Yes. Yeah. And the kind of two are like interlinked in, in I guess, ways I'm still discovering even now. <laughs> Yeah. What year did you get sober? Actually, the last time I had a drink was uh, somewhere between December 23rd and December 24th, because I'm not sure what time it was, uh, 2013. So uh, it's been a little while now. uh, But yeah, I'm not sure exactly on the exact, if it was like uh, midnight or two in the morning or four in the morning, but somewhere uh, right around Christmas Eve was the last time I had a drink in 2013. That's funny. My my sobriety date, I guess, is one of those amorphous things as well. I claim the 23rd because I started drinking on the 22nd of March was the last time that I did it. So it probably did carry over. But if we were going like West Coast time, I'd probably be sober on that date. So so we're sticking to the 23rd just <laughs> for for mine. Cool. Well, happy birthday because it's right, right when we're recording this. It's right around that. Congratulations. Yeah. Three days ago was six years, which is That's awesome. wild. And, and today is the five-year anniversary of my company. And they say most companies go out of business in the first five years. So nice. last night at, at 1030, I was saying to my wife, I was like, if we don't go out of business in one and a half hours... I'll have hit the five year mark and we'll beat the statistics that people are going out of business in the first five years. That's, that's amazing. So walk us through what's going on in your life leading up to when you decided to get sober. Yeah. So for me, think about it. It's like, I think like I was an alcoholic probably from birth. I mean, however you want to parse it, but like even thinking about the things I struggle with now as a sober person, I'm like, or or what led me to drink? I'm like, oh, wow. A lot of that stuff was there as I became a a little person as a kid. And and as a kid, I had a lot of anxiety and a lot of issues with authority figures, even in grammar school and a lot of escapism. I mean, when I was a kid, it was for reading and daydreaming and staring at clouds and stuff like that. But I also had insomnia in uh, fifth and sixth grade and I couldn't sleep because I had so much trouble at school and uh, the podcast kind of leads back to that. And then in high school, I discovered alcohol and I think I had drank like a few times before the first time I really got drunk. And it is one of those moments like that a lot of people talk about, like where it felt like transcendent to me the first time I really got messed up and I can remember it in detail and, it, and the night went horrible. I cracked my kneecap and it, and it was like, I got a bunch of other people in trouble. But for me, it was still like this moment where I felt like I discovered like relativity or something. Oh, and that was uh, somewhere around 15 or 16. And then I had grown up in a household where my dad had gotten sober like around when I was six or seven, but my mom was from a big Irish Catholic family that all lived in the town I grew up in. And I grew up in uh, Syracuse, New York, and alcohol was a big part of that family's life, like just a part of celebrations and stuff. So it was kind of like a little bit before I started drinking, confusing. And then once I started drinking, I, I don't know, like I, 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 I loved it. And I guess it's weird to say, but at the time, I, I wasn't good at very much. And even in high school and, and into the later years, I was like, wow, I'm pretty good at drinking. Like, I, <laughs> like <laughs> I found my thing. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, 
I don't know. I used it to escape. I used it to sleep. I used it to feel like I fit in. I used it for, I mean, mostly it helped me get out of my own head and and all the voices and the criticism I kind of had. It just gave me some numbness and some distance from that. And I thought it was the solution to a lot of things. And it was just part of who I was. It was really a big part of my identity. And for a long time, I just considered myself a drinker. I guess like there was times my drinking caused problems. But for the most part, I was just like, oh, this is just who I am. And as I started to get into my like 30s and issues started to come up, like I I was married. And so there was relationship issues. I had a business at the time and the business ended up going bankrupt. And, you know, I just wasn't ever happy and career issues and depression. I always blamed myself and not the alcohol. And I was like, oh, if I could just fix who I was, it'll be fine. And, and, and every once in a while, someone would say, oh, well, what about, you know, stopping drinking or what are you doing? You think the alcohol plays part? And I was like, no, no. Like, and I, I was being honest at the time. I was like, no, no, I'm a drinker. I'm not a drunk. And it, it just got worse and worse. And I got, I was stayed more delusional and there was different times I look back that could have been my bottoms that weren't. And it did get to the point where a few times towards the end, like I'd lost, I'd gone bankrupt, I'd lost my marriage and hurt the person I was married to. We had a daughter and trying to manage that relationship. I mean, she was only a couple of years old at the time. Um, and I did start being like, man, what am I doing? Or why do I keep mechanic where I felt like the choice got taken out of it. And I would be buying alcohol and I'd be like, man, I, I, I almost don't want to drink, but I, I can't stop. And there was a couple times I did try, but I think it was more to cover my rear end, like to get out of trouble instead of like being, trying to get sober. And eventually I still couldn't realize my own bottom And what happened was a couple people around me had some really bad bottoms and, and not only their bottoms kind of scared me, but it was more that I drank a lot with them and I felt like they were a cover for me in some sense. And I was like, wow, if they get sober and start drinking, like there's nowhere for me to hide now from the friends or family. And so it was almost like still that kind of selfish ego based mindset of like, oh man, like I'm going to be in bigger trouble than I am. And I was going to therapy again because a lot of times I was like, oh, like this is going to fix it. And I remember telling my therapist like, well, maybe I'll plan on getting sober like because it was going towards the holidays. And I was like, I don't want to ruin my holidays and get sober before the holidays. (laughs) And I remember the therapist was like, and I had lied about my alcohol use to the therapist. So this was like, I was finally getting honest. So the therapist, their mind was kind of blown, but they're like, are you listening to yourself? They, They were kind of trying to point out how ridiculous my thinking was. And then uh, what happened is, uh, you know, all those things kind of coalesced. And then I got really, really sick and, and I just couldn't drink for like a couple of days. Like I was just so sick and it was around the holidays. And I guess I was like, well, um, I took it as a, a head. To, I didn't take it really as a sign, but I was like, oh, let me just try to not drink and see if I could do this. And I started going to meetings and sitting in the back of the room quietly and, 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 you know, afraid and scared and, and wondering if I could make it to four days or five days or one month. I can still remember my first couple months. And, and again, just like we talked about, like, okay, I don't even know how I'm going to make it six months without drinking. And so it was for me, like it, it was one of those one day at a time things in a sense of like, okay, I could always drink tomorrow. And that really, really helped me of like, okay, I'm just not going to drink today, but I can drink if I can make it six months, uh, like I I can drink it six months. I just am not going to drink that till then. And another part of thing that helped me or mental trick I used was like pretending I was the scientist and I was like, okay, I'm just collecting this data. I have 30 years or 35 years of being drunk, uh, And I know what that's like. So what would it be like if I strung together six months? Like, what would my life be like? And and I kept, again, using that trick of like, well, I don't want to ruin this data. Like I've had, I have six months of data. If I get seven months, what will that be like? Um, And yeah, I started, I was going to meetings. I I was working the steps and uh, working with a sponsor and I've gone in and out of using the program and, and, and drifted away and drifted back. And um, I've tried to work like on my relationship with my higher power. 
it hasn't always been easy. Like I have been able to stay sober, but it hasn't always been easy not being a dry drunk in, in some sense. And, uh, you know, but I, I've tried to practice like the principles of the program. I, I've tried to, to find my way on this spiritual journey and try to do that. And I have tried to kind of take everything one step at a time and also kind of grow outside of the program. Like I still work with a therapist and I still try to have a morning and evening routine and yeah, eventually it was like I strung together some months and then it was a year and then it was like two years. And now I'm like, what the heck? Like, it really is like, wow. Like, I don't know, but i am never been more grateful. Like when I talk to people, it's like, man, this is the greatest gift you could possibly give yourself and the people around you. And, and, and especially that little kid part of me that couldn't sleep. It's like, man, like, just giving that gift to, to that kid and to my daughter and to my family and, and to the people to be of service, whether it's in the program or in life, uh, instead of just being, for me, it's like fear. That's been my higher power for most of my life. And, and so to not just be in the throes of my ego and my fears. And yeah, at some point, uh, I started a podcast along that journey, actually right before I got sober, uh, which we could talk, we'll talk about too, but that's kind of how it went for me uh, in a nutshell. That's incredible. So would you say that you have how many episodes now? 700? I think like 750 something. I'd have maybe 760. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty big number for sure. And when I was first introduced to your show... It, you know, in the introduction, you kind of say like most people say it takes a couple episodes before you really understand what's going on here. And for those that haven't listened, do you want to give sort of a, a brief overview of what your podcast is and why you made it to begin with? You mentioned the child you that couldn't sleep. And I know that was sort of part of the giving back. So you want to elaborate on why you started and what the goal was? Yeah. So I make this podcast called Sleep With Me and it's a bedtime story podcast for adults. And that's kind of like, doesn't actually describe it that well, but it's the best way I describe it. It's almost like you're in bed with someone and they're telling you a boring bedtime story or you're calling someone on the phone, uh, though that doesn't really happen anymore. Like, I don't know how many people call each <laughs> other on the phone at night, but like you're calling someone on the phone and they're telling you about their day in very minute detail, or they're spinning you a fantastically boring story that's also distracting. And the goal of the podcast is just to be distracting enough to take your mind off of whatever's keeping you awake, but not be so interesting that you have to listen. And yeah, it goes back to when I was a kid in, in fifth and sixth grade, like I was having a lot of trouble at school. I was terrified to go to school because I knew that I was going to either get in trouble or do something to either embarrass myself or to get punished by the teachers. I was going to a Catholic school, so I had these very strict nuns. And it just became this place I couldn't stop thinking about at night. So I never forgot like that lonely pain. And, and even when I told my parents, you know, I can't sleep, I was the oldest of six kids. And they were kind of like, well, just try to think of something nice or try to like relax. I think they wanted to help, but it was just like, and I find this with the podcast, it can be confusing for someone that can sleep to understand how bad it is when you can't sleep, the, the, the existential pain that you feel. And I remember I was on the, uh, at recess with another kid and I was telling him about it and he was like, well, my older brother listens to like comedy radio shows on the radio he was, why don't you listen to those? They're on at like nine, 10 o'clock at night. And I started listening to comedy radio and it never put me to sleep, but it made me forget about just took me outside of my head, like kind of like alcohol did, like, like where it just made me forget all my thoughts. And it was this pleasant distraction. It didn't have any consequences other than being a little bit tired for school. I never forgot though, that feeling of escape and safety that just laughing and hearing someone, it felt like they were just there to keep me company. And then over the years, like I've told people in my lives, bedtime stories, whether it's like kind of friends hanging out of parks or partners or, or whatever, like uh, camp people on camping trips. So when I started listening to podcasts and realizing you could kind of make a podcast about anything, I was like, how come there isn't any like a goofy bedtime podcast like the comedy show I listened to? 
I was like, oh, I wonder if I could do something like that, but to help people fall asleep. And I have a very developed inner critic, even though I'm sober, it's very strong. My internal critic was like, no, that is a stupid, stupid idea. And I was like, oh, okay. I mean, this was before I got sober anyway, but uh, it's still there. And, and I was like, okay, I won't do that podcast. And then a year went by and I was like, oh, wait, I, I, I love listening to these podcasts. Like, why can't I make a podcast? And it's like, uh, cause you're an idiot. That's why I like, it'd be embarrassing. You don't know how to make it. And I said, oh, okay, you're right. You're right. Right. And the idea just kept bubbling back up and I, and the critic was in charge of me. It was like, no, 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 you can't do that. You don't know how to make, you don't know how to make audio. You don't know how to be on the microphone. You're not going to follow through on that. And so I just kept giving up. And at the same time, even though I hadn't gotten sober and, and my attention was not focused on my alcoholism, I knew something was kind of out of place with my life. I was also had the suspicion that I was like, oh, I'm just not trying hard enough because I wanted to be a writer or do something creative. And so I had kind of set aside time where I was like writing and I was writing sketch comedy with kind of two other guys and I was writing some other stuff by myself and I would kind of sustained that work somehow I'd carved out some space uh, to do that and follow through. I, I think like my drinking probably got in the way of me progressing at it, but at least I kind of had set aside time to do that. One of the projects it, because of my behavior when I was under the influence, like blew up, like, uh, like the project I was working on with two other people was like, we just can no longer work together. Like, and I had had that time open and this part of me was like, why don't you start making that podcast? And it was a wiser part of me it is a voice that I don't always hear from. I hear from it maybe more often now, but I was like, who is that? And it's like, yeah, you have that time set aside. Why don't you start making that podcast before life takes over? And I was like, who, what, what, okay. And it's just like, just start making it and start putting it out. And I said, yes. And I was like, okay. And then I, I kind of was like reading and maybe this is what you went through when you started your show of like, oh, what is, how do you make a podcast? <laughs> what are the YouTube videos about it? What goes into it? Oh no, this is way too much. This is too scary. And the only things I learned was that it takes like two or three years to kind of for a show to develop and get an audience. And so again, I had like these healthy thoughts where it was like, okay, what is my biggest issue so far with making stuff. It was like not following through. And it was like, I don't even know what this podcast is. I don't know if anybody's going to listen. What would be a failure? Again, that same part of me that said start, it was like, not like if you don't do it, like, could, could you make it for three years? Like, or could you make it for two years? And I was like, maybe two years. And so I was like, okay, if so, if I make it for two years, that it'll be successful no matter what. And it was like, oh, okay. And even my internal critic was like, oh, okay. And then I also like broke it into smaller parts. Like I was like, okay, I had heard the statistic that most podcasts that make episode one don't make episode two. And that most podcasts, like 50% of podcasts stop between those two. And I don't think this is actually, this is like paraphrasing, but that another 50% of podcasts that make episode two don't make it to episode eight. And then another 50% of podcasts that make episode eight don't make it to episode 21. And then another 50% drop off between 21 and 50. And so I told my critic, I was like, well, what if those, we use those points too? Like, can we make two episodes? And then if you want, we could quit. Like if you're going to harass me and tell me what a failure I am and, and how bad this thing is, can we just make two episodes? And then can we just make eight episodes? And if you want eight episodes, we'll quit. And uh, those were the kind of bargains I had to strike at the beginning. And I just started making it. I started in October, 2013. But at first it was like getting in the way of my drinking, which was interesting. <laughs> like, like, and I was like, I knew I couldn't do it under the influence. Even like after one drink, I'd tried like recording one or two episodes. So then I used it as a, like a bargaining chip for a couple of months. I was like, okay, if we could just get this recorded, then you can drink as much as you want. Uh, but then I ended up getting sober a couple months later and it was I don't know if it was exactly the most healthiest transition, but it was like something that I could pour a lot of my time into at night and on the weekends when I might've been out numbing myself. And uh, yeah, I started it there and it kind of has gone from there. So when you started, you set basically points where you said, I need to get at least to two episodes 
and then we'll reevaluate. I need to get to eight episodes as like a challenge to yourself to force you to go through with the process. And did you evaluate after episode one, after episode two, eight? And did you sort of have the the back and forth with the critic, the well, you know, your your numbers are in and here's what we've put together because I know myself, I have a super, super small following from before I started the show. So obviously I'm not expecting to be getting any sort of big return from it. It's more to augment the other parts of my businesses that I run. So for me, the instant overnight success isn't even something that I'm looking at. So what's going through your mind after episode eight, which is just coincidentally where I believe this is number eight, something in that range, eight or nine. Well, that's great. That's great. Congratulations. Yeah. I mean, I think we're right. Like anyone that thinks like me, I would recommend this, even if someone has a show with other hosts, like instead of with your critic or whatever it is that gets in your way, but it was like, it was like a coping strategy in the sense that my critic would just wouldn't leave me alone to get the work done. And I was like, okay, please, like you could be as negative as you want at episode two and eight. And we will have these real meetings. If you just please let me make these other episodes. I, I'm promising you this isn't like we will stop. And very similar to you, like I had no following. So, and I did, and maybe this did help me like grow. And it was the right time as far as like, I was able to be compassionate with my critic in some sense and say, I totally understand that you think this is going to end in total disaster and humiliation. And that this other part of me, this dreamer part of me was like, geez, I just wish we'd have like a million listeners right away. And, and shouldn't we have a million listeners? Like, why isn't that happening? So I kind of like did have like enough space to say, Hey, those are legitimate concerns. Let's just talk about them at episode eight. And then it, it, it was hilarious because it would be leading up to that meeting of 8, 21, 50, 100. And I would find little positive things like, oh, eight people are listening to the podcast or, or early on, I didn't even get any feedback ever. So it was like, oh, well, we did follow through or, oh, this episode was a little bit better than this one or, oh, this is kind of fun. I'm having fun. And so when I would sit down with the critic, it was the most paper dragon, paper tiger situation where he'd be like, he'd be screaming at me up until the meeting. And then I'd say, all right, so this is like some of the good stuff that's happening. I know we don't have tons of listeners or we haven't gotten it. We got one email or whatever, but I still think it's pretty going pretty good. Like, what do you think? And it would just be like, there'd be silence. Be like, well, don't you have any bad, should we quit? What do you think? Ah, uh, no, I guess not. I guess we shouldn't quit. It's like, okay, well, but what about when you were screaming? <laughs> when we were walking to the meeting that this was a disaster, like this is your time to make your presence. No, I guess we should keep going. You're right. And so, yeah, that really has worked in the times that the podcast has gotten the hardest. And then I've started to overthink things and get in my own way is when I haven't, like, I think once I hit episode 100, I was like, okay, now I just want to make it to two years. And I didn't have any breaks like where I like, kind of reassess things like we're talking about. And that got really hard. Like, and then I think after two years, I was still trying to make it to three years in where I, I did lose my way or like panic or just grind and, and wish I was in control of things that weren't in my control. The little steps work, not just with not drinking with a lot of other stuff too. Yeah. So a big part of recovery for a lot of people what I find, and this actually translates into your enthusiasm with the podcast, it, it, it translates into when I'm doing business coaching with the response that I see a lot with my clients. It's very, very, very similar where you will start out with something and be on top of it 100 percent. Everything is perfect. Everything is crazy, but you continue to go through with it and you're getting very, very noticeable results immediately. And then it kind of gets to a point where you sort of reevaluate in sobriety for a lot of people. It's right around the six to nine month mark where they're like, you know what? I put in a whole lot of effort and I felt a whole lot better. I think we're good now. And in business coaching, I'll work with people and it'll be shorter. It'll be my business had a million problems. That's why I sought coaching. And then we get through them and it's a month later. And then it's, well, 
I'm good now that you put out all those fires in my life. So I don't really need help anymore because the big issues were tackled. So what's something that you're doing just to keep you going, even though at the time it may not have been a huge success? Was it just the deals with yourself? I mean, I think it was like I was lucky in the sense, yeah, it was the deals with myself. It was that for me, part of the journey of sobriety too is like realizing, and I know not everybody has a relationship with the kid side of themselves, but for me, I do. And it was like how much I traumatized that part of me and just ignored my own needs of like, I mean, not only the people in my lives needs, but that part of me that wanted to try to do stuff or try not to be afraid all the time where I was like, be quiet, kid, like just be quiet. And so I think, yeah, initially there was this buoyancy where it was like, wow, I get to make something and you're going to be here to follow through and help me. And then it would get hard. And a lot of times when it would get hard, I would kind of just be like, okay, let's not overthink this. Like we're just trying to help a couple people fall asleep. And when I would be like, this isn't perfect or there isn't enough people listening or how are we going to make this into a living? And I'd be like, okay, well, let's just focus. Like we're just helping somebody fall asleep here. Remember when we couldn't fall asleep and it'd be like, oh yeah. And then as eventually like after like six to nine months, I would get occasional feedback for the show. I mean, it took that long for me. And then I would be like, oh, okay, here's a real person that you're helping fall asleep. And it kind of, it just went from there. And, and again, I, I also looked at it like this experiment of like, okay, well, like uh, this didn't go good or this went good. There's other times though that for months I would go down the rabbit hole of being like, oh my gosh, I got to get more listeners. What can I do to get more listeners? And so I would exhaust myself. And, and so sometimes it was making mistakes and then being like catching myself at least at some point and being like, oh, what am I doing? Or asking for help, whether it's somebody in the program or somebody in podcasting being like, hey, I'm freaking out about this. Uh, I mean, I remember one time, I don't know how many years, this was a couple of years into making the podcast. My listeners did a poll on Facebook where they were like, how many hours do you think it takes to make an episode of Sleep With Me? And the numbers were really low, like not accurate of how many hours it takes to make an episode. And I was freak, it freaked me out. I was like, I'm so doomed the show is not going to ever be valued in a way that I could make a living at it. And, and I was just panicking and burning, like grinding my gears. And I emailed somebody uh, that makes a podcast and she was doing it for a living. And I was like, I sent this like embarrassing email, just full of my needs and a really needy email, but she was in a place where she could hear it. And she said, sounds like you're freaking out. Why don't you give me a call? And so I called her and she, she was like, tell me what's going on. And I said, and she goes, yeah, it sounds like you're freaking out it's natural. Like I freak out all the time. And, uh, she said, uh, you know, the one thing that's easy to forget is that the people that are listening to the show, they don't make your show and they don't know what goes into making it. And they are only there to consume it. Like it's not a negative, it doesn't have to be all or nothing thing. Like some of them might be interested, but they're not, your needs really aren't their concern. You know, you got to figure out a, another way to get those needs met, like because you can't. You're trying to get it from your audience, and it's just not not going to work. So, like asking for help is another thing. Wherever you could ask for help, just to get another opinion to be like, you can even see it on some people's faces sometimes when you're like, "Hey, what do you think of this?" I'm, I'm worried, and then they just give you this look. You're like, "Oh, oh boy, okay." <laughs> and it, you don't have to say anything. I totally uh, okay. So humbling yourself and being able to ask for help when you don't know the answer, I feel like that's something that in recovery, especially like you said, you'd done 30 some years of drinking and that's the only life you knew. And then all of a sudden you're you're dealt with, hey, here's a situation. And in the past, I drank over this. And now if that's not an option, if I don't have something else to fill that habit and fill that void, then I'm just going to be miserable because that wasn't even the problem. It's not that my drinking is my problem, but it's the solution to everything in my life. And paradoxically, the solution is also causing all the issues in my life. So if I cut out the solution to all my problems, now I'm stuck with me and me is even worse than having the problems that I was creating after I was drinking because of my issues with me. Hey, guy who has 
even a week sober if I've got one day, what did you do to get to a week? And they say, I have no idea. I'm freaking out, man. <laughs> this doesn't work. Well, it does work. I've got a week. I've never had a week. And then, okay, ask this guy. He's got six months. Okay, guy was six months. What do I do in this situation? He's like, ah, I was in this situation once and this is what I did. And then you're like, fine, I'll try that. I don't even think it'll work. And then it works. And you're like, oh, I didn't have to figure that out. And I didn't have to drink over it. And I know for myself in business, when I was starting out my first year, it was a ton of just hard headed. Well, I'm a college graduate and I know how to run a business, but I never run a business before. And year one, we did 36,000. Year two, I got a mentor and a coach and someone to show me how to grow and scale a business. People that had already done it before, like the people were in my industry already and they were killing it. And I was just like, what do you do? And they're like, this is how you do it. Da, 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 da. And I had dabbled a bit with hiring people, but they just told me, this is what you do. You replicate this process. The next year we did almost 2 million in sales. And it's like, all I had to do was just humble myself and realize I don't have to know every single answer. And if I'm just resourceful enough to know where to ask or the right questions to ask, there are a lot of shortcuts that can be taken. Now, you still have to put in the work, which I think is one of the parts where people, they see that metaphorical iceberg and you see the tip of the iceberg where it's like, this is success. And then the bottom of it that's real deep underwater is all the heartache and the failures and the losses and the learning experiences, all those things that's not what's on the surface. You know, your highlight reel is just the wins. So what are some of the failures or at least supposed failures that turn into learning experiences or opportunities that you've experienced throughout the podcast? Yeah. I mean, I think like, again, like, like a synchronicity of something of making the podcast, it has been able to teach me so many lessons that I've been able to apply or I've been learning lessons in sobriety and facing challenges in the podcast. And a lot of times it is almost every challenge with the podcast is me when I'm like, okay, what's the base issue here? And it's like, oh wait, I, I'm the, that's, that's where the challenge is coming for podcasting in particular. I mean, the hardest thing is accepting, well, I guess just like life is like accepting the things that are outside of your control and then, the, the stubborn part of you that doesn't believe it. Oh, well, how many people listen to your podcast? Well, that's kind of mostly out of your control. Sure. We could debate like the nuances of that, but it's like, when it comes down to it, well, it's kind of out of your control, making money with your podcast, like maybe partially in your control, but a lot of it's not like at least initially over the first, first while, or, or if you're doing it in a kind of different direction, I mean, I remember the the audience thing and the noise, like it, like with podcasting, like it, everybody has an opinion about podcasting and everybody has a way to make it work. And at the time when I was first starting out the first couple of years, like I said, I didn't, we were talking about, like, I didn't necessarily, I was such a suspicious, skeptical person. I didn't, wasn't in a place where I could ask somebody and for help. So I was like, oh, I got to figure this out on my own. So that's one mistake is trying to figure it all out on my own. Uh, but then it was like, oh, I, that I can control this thing that's outside of my control if I just follow enough of this noise. And I remember I had been putting the podcast out three times a week, which is a very tough schedule. I had a full-time job. And then I had heard all this stuff about niching and podcasting. Oh, you got to control these niches. You got to dial your niche in or your niche or whatever. And so then I was like, well, what about daytime sleep podcasts? I, I got to control that niche too, or else you know, it's going to get swept out from under me and that'll get me my audience. So I was trying to go from working a full-time job, being a co-parent with my daughter. And then I was like, oh, I'm going to also do a daytime sleep podcast, like for, for like about sleep issues. And I remember like, so that it was a fourth episode I had to produce every single week. And it quickly, after like six weeks, I was like not sleeping, way overdoing it. And I was still like, and, and it wasn't impacting my audience. It wasn't bringing me a new audience. It wasn't an instant a fix. And I think I made 12 episodes and I was, I, again, I guess I was like a lot of cognitive dissonance or delusion because I was like, Oh no, this isn't the problem. Like I just got to get more efficient. I got to be more efficient. And again, some wiser part of me sat me down one time. Cause I'm like, Oh, I was just so tired. And then I started feeling 
Like I had to cope with that by procrastinating. And this part of me was like, listen, do you want to make a podcast to put people to sleep or do you want to make a podcast about sleep issues? Because you're going to have to make a choice. Which one is it? Because in my opinion, I don't know where this voice is coming from, but it's like, in my opinion, the podcast that's put, putting people to sleep is going pretty good. And you're kind of, no offense, kind of messing it up, like doing this other stuff. I don't know if you're scared or what, but maybe you should just stop. And, and I cut back and it instantly was like letting a rubber band go where it just gave me some energy and it helped carry me through another six months until I think like a, a couple of years later, I cut back again. I think it was at the end of last year. And it was right around the time I was trying to transition into doing this as a job. And I was like, man, I don't even know if I can keep up with three episodes a week and have a healthy program and healthy personal relationships. And I was like, is my relationship with my podcast unhealthy? Like I'm still trying to control it and force it to, to be something I can do as a job. And I ran the numbers with somebody. I said, okay, let's sit down. Let's do a time budget for how much time it takes to make your podcast every week, how much time you wish you had to make it every week, how much of that, what your financial budget is, what if that time budget was all paid by you and other staff, and when, once I saw those hard numbers, I was like, this is not feasible. Like I need to cut back to two shows. And I was so terrified that the audience was going to be mad. But again, it was like, and maybe it is my relationship with my higher power. It was like, okay, are you trying to sustain the podcast that's, and put people to sleep? Or are you trying to get certainty? Because a lot of times that's my default need is certainty. I don't care if it's bad certainty or good Like we kind of, you had mentioned it, like when I started the show, I was like, I would have appreciated it is if you start a podcast, then you submit it to like the International Podcast Organization of Podcast Wisdom. And then they come back and they're like, nope, you're banned from podcasting for life. (laughs) Or they're like, congratulations, you have a podcast and now we're going to give you like $3,000 stipend a month. Like (laughs) that would have been easy for me. Like I could have taken that if they're like, nope, you you can never podcast again. I'd be like, great. I'll move on to something else. But uh, it's not so easy. Like as we learn, like life is like much more gray or, or palette of colors than just black and white. Yeah. And a lot of times they they say in recovery, don't quit before the miracle happens. And I know for myself and my business, and it was actually, if I knew what I knew now about how things 99 times out of 100 play out when I was in the situation, just for context on the background, my remote IT company, it's super, super, super under the microscope and there's a million scams in India. And so we just kind of get grouped in with all of them, even though it's completely different and it's in the United States. So I just kind of shrugged off the, well, they're not going to get mad at us or look into any, any upset customer ever. They're, they're going to understand, you know, there's hundreds of other ones. Everybody's happy. This one person's upset. Okay. Okay. It's not the end of the world. And I was just extremely naive because it's been my experience in the last four years. This was almost one year into running the company and my credit card merchant, it stopped giving me the money that we were earning. We were still processing sales, but it wasn't depositing into my account. And I was under the impression, well, they'll just, you know, give it to me eventually. So we'll just keep going like that. They'll understand. It was just a silly mistake on their part. So we just kept running the business, not making any money. And I just was naive and was like, well, we'll we'll eventually get it. We'll we'll eventually get it. And it got to the point I ran out of money, just out of money. And then had to take out loans to cover payroll. And then through a ton of great people that I met, I was able to fix a solution, have a different merchant and great lesson learned, move forward. And then things really, really started blowing up. But knowing what I know now, if someone came to me and explained my situation, I would say, no, you're done. They will never approve you for another account because of reasons X, Y, and Z. You're never going to get that money that you think that you're going to get. They're just going to keep that forever. And, but I was just, this was happening in February, 2015 and the company started blowing up that following June. So 
the persistence and the grit that comes into it where you may think, well, this is as good as it gets or that negative self-talk of who am I to think that I can even run a company? Who am I to think I can run a podcast? Who am I to think that I can get sober? Do you think just the grit and tenacity really helps you get through to where you're at now? Is that one of the key focal points and reasons behind your success? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting hearing your perspective on it because it it triggers this thought of me of like, maybe this is part of the recovery process too. Is like, I didn't even realize this, but like taking something from being a drunk for me of like stubbornness and delusion of like, Oh, I don't have a drinking problem. I'm just going to keep drinking. At any point it would have just said, I mean, it wouldn't have been easy, but it'd be like for a non alcoholic to be like, Oh, just, I'll just stop drinking. Like, but for me, it was like a stubbornness. I mean, fueled by addiction, but like of not quitting no matter what. And now like, yeah, that grit and that grind. And sometimes it is stubbornness to just keep going and like, to be like, well, my gut thinks we should just keep going. I'm not sure. Yeah. It looks like all of these other indicators aren't great, but let's just keep going. And I think also the permission to kind of reassess things like, well, let's just keep going for a few more months and see, or let's keep going and knowing For me, a lot of it is like knowing that I have a desire to escape pain and escape confrontation and escape difficult things. And now a lot of times it's like, oh, wait, I also have this gift of sobriety of awareness of that. Like in the past, I didn't have an awareness of that. I didn't have an awareness that sometimes I can have grit and sometimes I can be stubborn. And so then sometimes I can find some quiet place or ask for help and be like, well, which is it? Am I being stubborn or am I, am I just grinding it out? Like in a good way, like, is it just a couple more months? Am I being resilient? And I think just having that choice, like in the past, I didn't, I mean, I didn't have a choice, like, or I made my choice. I'd cast my lot with alcohol. And now I do have a choice and not all the time. So like a lot of times I'm delusional and it's not till the next day when somebody's yelling at me or upset with me, I realize, <laughs> oh boy, or you realize you let somebody down and then you, then you have a choice to apologize <laughs> or to make amends or something. But it's like, you know, it doesn't make everything perfect and it doesn't make me just not want to avoid pain and conflict. Oh boy, do I want to still avoid those things? But sometimes there can be a pause of a moment in there and, and then I can realize, oh, wait, no, I have a choice. Do, uh, I'm in a flight. Do I want a flight or do I want to get some help or take a break? And that's like the biggest miracle of sobriety. But even though it's a small one, it, 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 yeah. So I know for my journey, I remember I had 90 days sober. And I remember just kind of taking a step back and being like, you know what? My life is way better than it used to be. And then with my company, I remember when we hit a hundred thousand all time. And I remember thinking, this is actually going somewhere. What did it feel like for you when you realized your podcast was more than just this thing that you do? Yeah, for me, it has still been like the podcast is still like a wrestling match with my my demons sometimes. So it is like, oh, you want all that? You still want all this certainty from the podcast? But it's been a slow progression for me. It was like the first time I could pay somebody else, and then I made that decision, like that the first money that came in from the podcast, I would use to pay an editor to help me instead of paying myself, and to be like when I felt neutral about it, I mean, part of me was resentful. It's like, what do you mean? Like, what are you crazy? You're going to pay somebody else to work on this podcast. I'm working nonstop. Like, and it's like, well, it's, you know, it's just enough money to get the episodes edited and that'll give us more time to be like proud of that and, and to be like, to be a win. And then it was like, again, asking for help and people saying, well, you don't have to quit your day job. Like, you could slowly transition. Maybe you could just bring in enough money and find out if you could go part-time at your job or three quarters time or buy some extra vacation and see what happens like that. So it was like a lot of those like little decisions, um, like being able to make those that I think, uh, I don't even remember what our question, what the question was, but 
Uh, it, Me neither. It, it, no. <laughs> when, when, when did you discover and realize that things were actually going somewhere? You know, for me, to be honest, like it was a personal thing, but that the podcast made possible was like last, and it was just last year was a big moment for me. Like I took a trip alone with my daughter. I mean, me and her mom are divorced. And even though I'd been sober for a while, it was our first just solo dad and daughter vacation. Like we had done family trips and stuff. And I just know that would not have been possible when I was drinking. Like, sure, I could have like tried to maintenance drink on the trip with her, but it, then I would have been resentful because I was like, oh, I can't drink as much as I want to or, or whatever. Like, it just wouldn't have been possible and it wouldn't have been enjoyable. And the fact that I could wake up, go to bed in a hotel room and then wake up in the next morning and have energy and not have this latent anxiety that like like I was a bad parent or that's, you know, that I lost control or something or that I had to maintain control. I just felt like this freedom to enjoy the time with my daughter that I know sobriety brought me, like that I could be present there and enjoy the time and it could pay for it. It wasn't like a super fancy vacation, but, but like, it was like, I don't know. So for me, that was like a big moment is, uh, I guess being able to take a break from the podcast is also a good time to be like, okay, I don't, I can take it, take a break and everything will be okay. Yeah. That was a big moment for me. Yeah. And you had mentioned how you're willing to take the money and reinvest it into the show so that you could get your time back. And one of the big things that I touch on with the solopreneurs that are trying to grow their business is that when you've lived your entire life, your idea of currency is I trade you my time. So here's my nine to five. Here are my eight hours. And I am exchange those, those eight hours for X dollars. And when you get into entrepreneurship and owning a business, it's the opposite. You're trading your dollars for other people's time. Their skill is just the detail of what that time is. But being able to afford yourself the time to go on that vacation, you wouldn't have been able to do that had you not been paying somebody else to do the editing, correct? Yeah, yeah. Like it, it was literally like a stage in the development of the podcast and, and just being able to enjoy, like I knew that the podcast was safe in, in other people's hands and that, and also that, that larger issue of like, oh, I've made something that I can trust the audience isn't going to be, why didn't you get back to my email? Or, Oh, I, you know, I knew you were a fraud the whole time. Like you took a week off. That wasn't true. That, that, yeah, the audience wants me to take a week off too. And that they understand that I'm a human being. It, it takes a lot of growth, I guess, to get to that point. But yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's nice to, to be slowly getting there. Yeah. And sometimes people do need to understand. And again, it's, it's difficult if you're not in that space, but sometimes people need to take a break in order for there to be longevity because you can get from point A to point B with your car redlining the entire time. And that will be the fastest way that you can get there. But if you expect to get from B to C and C to D and D to E and continue that journey, the car will break down if you're redlining every single day. And the lie we tell ourselves is, well, I need to make good time because that's what matters. But in all reality, when you have the tenacity to keep going, even when you take a little break, and I know that my employees will see and be like, yeah, well, you spent like a month in Europe last year. Like you've got the easy life. And on the surface that happened, however, when we take those breaks and steps back, it's not just about the, oh, well, you're a fraud, like you enjoyed your life. Most people get into entrepreneurship because they want to have more money and more free time. And the opposite is usually what happens. People start killing themselves working 80 hour weeks to get less money than they did when they were working for someone else with all these new responsibilities and all these new unknown unknowns because there's no way that you could possibly know everything that you need to know when you start getting into any new venture, but especially business ownership and podcasting. I mean, I've been very blessed that right off the rip, I was introduced with the producer who handles 99% of everything that you guys see. 
I've got my graphics designer from my digital marketing company who does all of the cool things and like the pictures that go on YouTube and the video editing and all, all the cool stuff. Like I am the personality and my time is best devoted to having the interactions with the guests, but pretty much everything else is the people behind the scenes that really make it go. And because I have so many different things on my plate, I've come to understand, and that's been just my normal response to things is that, well, I can pay other people and that's how I have the time. So people will say, well, what do you do? And well, I own an IT company and I own a digital marketing company and does web design also. And well, SEO and marketing and I have a podcast and, and I do business coaching and financial coaching. And yeah, so I'm kind of busy. I, I do a lot, but the things that I do I make sure are the things that only I can do. And just like with your show, when you're telling the stories and I I did want to touch on, we'll, we'll come back to your stories, but just to finish the thought that I find people who can execute and execute consistently to get the product from A to B so that I can be focusing on working on my business, not in my business. And but just to to take a step back, though, I remember I was listening to your show and I was thinking this guy must be on so many different drugs in order to come (laughs) up with these stories. What's your what is your thought process when you come up with shows or do you have a timeline or an outline or how do you come up with these things? Yeah. So it kind of depends. Like I learned kind of the it took me about 100, 150 episodes to kind of fall onto the, the rhythm of the show now. So I have like three types of episodes. Like I have a TV recap style episode where I'll have like 10 pages of notes from watching a TV show like three or four times. And then I'll use the notes to kind of construct a, it'll be like a meandering recap of like what's on the background in a TV show and what costumes they're wearing and how they're holding their bodies. And then um, like an improv episode where I'll kind of make up a story. I mean, those have developed over the years and kind of, a, I'll generally try to have some plot points or some random words that I can like randomly generate or something, or it used to be based on trends on Twitter, but that's kind of not sleepy. <laughs> so, so over the past couple of years, I've avoided that. But when those ones could be like fantastical made up stories or personal essays that are still kind of silly and goofy. And then I write stories for an episode and there'll be like, just like kind of Saturday morning cartoon-esque, but a little bit more fantastical and weird, like you're saying. So the last series I did was a, a sci-fi series where I was trapped on a spaceship with the nuns from my childhood. And we were like tr- trying to work together because that'd be my worst nightmare, of course. Like we needed each other for survival. Uh, and that was called Nuns in Space. Uh, then, then this season, right now I'm in the middle of a season of a show called <laughs> Big Farm in the Sky P.I., which is about a private eye in the afterlife. <laughs> like he died and in his afterlife, he's a private eye solving cases in an afterlife. It's not kind of heaven or hell, but so goof, it, it's like silly stuff to like made to like make bedtime feel less pressure and, and more fun. But also like the, the stories are very winding and I'll just talk about like almost anything like, uh, yeah, like, okay, well, what kind of, what, you know, what do they have for lunch? You know, what, if you were living in clouds, like, what would you eat? Do you eat clouds or do, is that how you get your water? Oh, but I don't know, mean to bring this up, but where, would, what are your other needs? Where do you meet those needs? Cause is that what rain is? Oh gosh, I'm never going to go outside. Like, so stuff like that it's just, and I have a calm meander, like meandering pace. It's not for everybody cause it is weird and, and outside of the box it, I thought it would only work for people like me that um, are overthinkers, but it also ends up helping like other people that have like chronic pain. But I think it's just like, so it's like the kind of thing people didn't know they were looking for it. And then when they find it, they're like, oh, this is what I was looking for. And then other people are like, oh no, this is not what I was looking for. I do not like this. Uh, so that's actually good in some sense. It's helped me like develop a thicker skin, but it's also like helps people identify like, oh, this isn't for me. Like, uh, and the majority of those people move on. Yeah. And I think it really does come down to knowing your strengths and capitalizing on them 
and clearly just your ism of just the way that you tell the stories and the way that you describe just all these things that almost seems nonsensical and then it all comes back around and it makes sense, but then you fall asleep. So I'm, I'm curious though, because you have a relatively large following in the podcast space. So how do you get successful when the whole point of your show is to put your <laughs> audience to sleep? It, it, it adds some extra humility for sure. Like without a doubt, <laughs> like every day I'm taught an extra layer of humility and then being, but, but in, in all seriousness, it's like, I think it really is a matter of uh, for me, like, a lot of people, when I ask them, they're like, oh, when was the inflection point or when was the hockey stick growth? And it really like it never has been. There's been a, one or two spikes where the show's spiked and then gone back down. But it really is a matter of like people listening to the show, people getting to know it, liking it, and then word of mouth. Like my show grows on a slow, steady basis. And it actually, it doesn't even grow in the summertime or at the holidays at Flatlines. But when people are in their life in, in like a normal habit, whether they're a student or a parent or just someone working their job, they, they like the podcast. It's different. And, and I ask them on a regular basis, hey, like, could you spread the word about the show? That's how we grow. And people spread the word. Or then someone listens and they, they're a writer and they write an article about it. Or they're, they're someone, their, their grandmother listens and is a hardcore listener and they're a writer. And so it's like, I've been able to not just get the word of mouth, but like good press because of like people's natural relationship with the show. And that's really like been how I've grown my show. I mean, I've heard of like overnight successes and yeah, there sometimes there are overnight successes and everyone has a different story of like how they climb the mountain. But yeah, that's kind of like, for me, it's just like asking my listeners, saying thank you and them sharing their show with people in their lives. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, they kind of go into their business or whatever they're doing and they just assume that well, if I do a good job, everybody will just tell all their friends and we'll get all these great things. But sometimes your customers and listeners, they sometimes they just need you to tell them, hey, do you know any solopreneurs who could benefit from coaching in their business? Do you know anybody who's working 80 hours and not making the kind of money that they want to make? And then, oh, yeah, Dave, he's a great guy. I'll, I'll introduce you. Perfect. Thank you. And it's not only just marketing on a selfish level, but when you're providing value and service to other people who can benefit from it, take money out of the equation. If you're just helping somebody, then if you are not asking people to spread the word, then you're doing the people that need it the most a disservice because you can be the best in the world. But if nobody knows you exist, it doesn't matter. You know, Michael Jordan, if he never played basketball, no one would be talking about him. Michael Jordan wouldn't be the Michael Jordan that he is if he never played in the NBA. He could have all these skills, but we talk about him because everybody learned who he was and he put on a show for so long. And that's why you know who he is and is recognized as the greatest if we take out the LeBron like arguments and stuff, but just the Michael Jordan of Michael Jordans. So, yeah. <laughs> so wrapping up, Drew, what suggestions do you have for listeners who are trying to take their business to the next level or they're trying to grow their podcast? If you're, if you're trying to grow your business or your podcast, it's like you have to ask, kind of just like you said. And it's one thing to remember is it's not like... Yeah, there's nothing wrong with asking. And when you're not asking, you're almost assuming something that isn't true, like that people naturally know the power of word of mouth and like that it's a positive thing. Like I think like as I've been able to deconstruct podcasting, I'm like, oh wait, a regular podcast listener doesn't know that they have this immense power by just sharing the show and they don't even know how to share it. Like, so you have to ask and you have to say, hey, here's a way to share the show. Or hey, if you're just if you see an article about sleep, comment on it. Or if someone, you know, someone that can't sleep, or like you said, a solopreneur, like just mention the show, like your honest experience with it. And then you have to follow up and say, thank you. Like, and praise the people if you can, I mean, you can't always do that, but 
because they deserve a thanks. Like they're doing a huge service to you, but it's like, Hey, if this has impacted you, here's some ways you can do it. And it really is powerful. I think like we do live in this time that there's a lot of stuff that takes, whether it's overthinking or, or just cultural things that takes our power away or makes us feel powerless or makes us feel apathetic and almost like you're up against that, like you're up against yourself and whatever you're, you're, is going to get in your way. And then on the other side of it, it's like, don't get mad at people. I mean, I, I get resentful about things and then I try to deal with my resentment, but it's like, yeah, it's just not natural. Like most people, you could create empathy. It's like, oh, I feel powerless a lot of times. I feel scared a lot of times. Maybe that's just why it's harder to get people to act. And so then it's like, oh, okay, well, what are some easy ways to do it? And then, yeah, similar to that is like, for me, it's always taking a step back and breaking things into smaller parts. I mean, I know that's like a trope, but it's like, oh, why why am I having trouble getting this done? Or why am I try, having trouble moving ahead? And a lot of times if I try to break that into parts or break it into five minute chunks, if it's something like filing stuff, it's like, oh, can I file for one minute today? Or can I, fi- can I file for 10 minutes or five minutes? That's been really powerful for me is like just timers of stuff I don't want to do and timing it. I love that suggestion. And I know for myself, a lot of times, I need some outside force to just push me forward. And I share this a lot with my listeners, but my to-do list, every time I get an idea in my head or I see something that I need to have done, for instance, to get the photo that we'll put for uh, the advertisement with your headshot on this show, for instance, I'll have on my Trello to-do list, send, send the picture of Drew to Eric to get done. And it'll be in my list for however long until it gets up there. But my assistant will put on my to-do list five things from my never-ending to-do list that I have to do today that are non-negotiable. And just the act of getting just five things done and having the to-do list to be empty, when it's broken down into these little actions, you know, my my to-do list isn't have the show ready to go, but just get the headshot image, get the recording over to the producer, get the upload onto YouTube, all these things. It's, it's not just the get the show done, but when it's broken down into five, 10, 20 minute actions, you can make a lot of headway. If you, if you just do multiplication, if you do 10 minutes on something, 365 days a year, yeah, yeah, you know, you've spent days working on it. So it doesn't have to be this all or nothing grandiose. You can break things down. And when you pair that with grit and tenacity of, I'm just going to do the one more thing that I know I need to do. And that can go with sobriety as well. It doesn't have to be this gigantic thing. They recommend calling your sponsor, praying, meditating, whether or not you feel like it. If you just continue to do it, when you put forth the actions, you'll get the results and they don't always look the same for everybody. You know, I've been extremely blessed that I've been able to grow my companies the way that I have. And it's not just a one size fits all, but there are reoccurring themes. And one of them is taking big ideas and breaking them into small chunks. If I want to have this huge campaign to go out, what is the next five minute action that I can take to just move the needle a little bit more. And that comes from having clarity and from purpose where knowing where you are and where you want to go. All these things tie into so many different aspects of life, particularly business, particularly entrepreneurship, particularly recovery. All these things really, really tie in together. And I think it's great that you've that you've gone through with the listeners and explained how not only does the process for getting sober look a certain way, but having a successful podcast is very similar. You continue to do the process. You will eventually get the results. Some people are overnight successes. It's probably not going to be you, but that doesn't mean that you should just quit when the going gets tough because the reality is the people that make the highlight reel, there's a lot of work that goes into it. Not everyone can be a super magic overnight success or people that have a following, you know, there's, 
there's so much that goes into all the things that a lot of people that are just sort of in the average world, they just say, well, that person's lucky. I will say that I'm blessed. I will say that there's a ton of opportunities that came my way that I capitalized on that had nothing to do with me. I agree with that a hundred percent. However, when those opportunities came my way, I had enough experience and tenacity to be able to recognize them and to capitalize on them. So Drew, I don't want to take up any more of your time. Can you tell uh, listeners how they can find you to check out your podcast and any asks that you have of them? Yeah. Yeah. That's great advice. I'm just sitting there thinking, (laughs) I'm still listening to you. So um, (laughs) yeah, let's see. Uh, I'm at Dearest Scooter on Twitter and Instagram. Those are good places to get a hold of me. My website is sleepwithmepodcast.com. Make sure you put the podcast in there and there's a contact form on there. And the po- you could listen to the podcast in any podcast app. You just search for Sleep With Me. It should come up. And yeah, give it a shot. If, uh, and if you end up not liking the podcast, like I have a list of resources at sleepwithmepodcast.com slash no thank you. So I have like other sleep podcasts and stuff I use because uh, it's like, yeah, it doesn't work for everybody. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. It's like, uh, I totally agree. Like, I'm so grateful uh, that I get this ongoing opportunity. And uh, yeah, this, thank you for this opportunity to share. It's like, hopefully it helps and if anybody out there thinking about starting a podcast or struggling with sleep in, in the audience, like hit me up for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time and take care. All right. Thank you. Hey, this is Andrew, and I just wanted to thank you so much for listening to Self Made and Sober. As you know, I'm a business coach, and if you're interested in taking your business to the next level, go to lasisecoaching.com slash 30. That's L-A-S-S-I-S-E coaching.com slash 30 and sign up for a free 30-minute business coaching session. I've helped tons of entrepreneurs grow their businesses from pure chaos to six, seven, and even eight-figure operations. Heck, I even 48X'd my own company from year one to year two, and I know I can do the same for you because I've been there and I want to help. So that's lasisecoaching.com slash 30. And again, thank you so much for listening to Self Made and